Hello. 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 Come on. Can you hear me? Is the mic okay? That's here as well? Yeah. Okay, my man. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Can you hear us? Uh, hello, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Uh, so what time is it? Yeah, I can. It was a little bit dodgy, the signal of ours. You're going in and out. <laughs> also, I got no idea how to work this thing, so that's another part. Uh, this is really awkward. Um, again, I guess. Um, yeah. I heard my car is breaking, I guess. Yeah, it's breaking, it's also a task. Hi, can you hear each other? Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay. Now, uh, let us begin, some, shall we? Hello from Slovenia. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our uh, group of uh, students from the High School of Economics, a location of High School in Zen. I'm Elin. I'm now. I'm Anna. I'm I'm an eight and I have to remove. I'm an Yash. It's back to me. Where are your students? Uh, where are your students? Um, I'm Cecilia. Yeah. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay, let's go. Uh, we are ready. Please take part in the video conference about uh, alternative energy. Only I think this could, uh, thing would be better if you could join your union taxes. Um, we are from a country 35 times smaller than Texas. Our neighboring countries are Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Croatia. The capital is Ljubljana. Our school is located in Italia with approximately 48,000 inhabitants in the Savinska region. The school has two units, the secondary vocational school and a vocational college. The secondary school students are aged 14 to 20. That's us. We are taught to work as shop assistants, administrators, or economic technicians. After earning the title of economic technicians, the students can enter the work market or continue their studies at, at vocational college, having the possibility to choose between two programs, commercialist and accountant. Most students commute to school from neighboring villages and smaller towns. Many pupils are from the former Yugoslavian families and from Albania. We can say that we are just every students who like it very much we can do something different from just attending classes. At first, we did some research and gathered information about solar and wind energy and a nuclear plant in Slovenia. Now, would you guys like to introduce yourselves as well, or do we just go straight to the topic at hand? Um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go straight to the topic. That's... Hi, I'm Anna. This is Naya and Erdil. Uh, we're going to talk about solar energy. And then that's why I'm going to watch it. Solar energy comes to Earth in the form of electromagnetic waves and is part of the natural energy flow that maintains the balance of our planet. The advantages and disadvantages of solar power compared to the other forms of renewable energy have been greatly debated. While obviously superior to some forms of energy, solar power is high cost and intensity dependent on geography have limited its appeal. However, a large number of advantages also merit further development and have even possible adaption for residences. Now I'm going to take uh, now I'm going to talk about advantages of solar power. Solar energy remains popular because it's both a renewable and clean source of energy. These advantages, along with the hope that eventually nations can use more solar power to decrease global warming, ensure its popularity. Solar energy is a true renewable source. 
All areas on the wood have the ability to collect some, collect some amount of solar power, and solar power is available for collection each day. Solar energy is not polluting, it does not, it does not create greenhouse gases, such as oil, gas, energy dust, nor does it create waste that must be stored, such as nuclear energy. It's also far more quiet to create and harness, drastically reducing the noise of pollution required to, co to convert energy to a useful form. Residential size solar energy systems are also, uh, also have very little impact on the surrounding en environment in contrast with other renewable energy sources such as wind and hydroelectric power. Solar panels have no moving parts and require very little mention beyond regular cleaning. Without moving parts to break and replace, after the initial cost of installing the panels, mentions and repair costs are very reasonable. So, uh, I'm going to talk about disadvantages. So, first of all, the sun sends in three hours on Earth so much energy as population uses it in one year. So, disadvantages. Solar power remains rare in many countries due to some fairly significant. Cost. The largest problem of using primarily solar energy is the cost involved. Despite advantages in technology, solar panels are expensive. Even when the cost of panels is ignored, the system required to store the energy for us can also be quite costly. Weather dependent, although some solar energy can be collected during even the cloudiest days, solar energy collection is dependent on sunshine. Even a few cloudy days can have a large effect on an energy system. Once that fact that solar energy cannot be collected at night is taken into account. Uh, geographic limitations. While some areas would benefit from a depending solar power, other parts of the world will receive little benefit from current solar system. Solar panels still require direct sunlight to collect large amounts of power, and in many areas of the world, there are few days that would power a system. Solar energy can be converted into a useful form of energy in four ways. To directly heat buildings or water, for the production of biomass, which runs through photosynthesis, which are in trees, bacteria, algae, corn, and so soybeans, for the growth of plants, of plants which are food to humans and other animals and for the production of electricity. These are the, the devices that we use for exploiting energy for our needs. Solar cells that produce electricity, solar panels which we heat water, solar concentrator systems for electricity production through thermal energy. Typical solar power plants have average 10 to 10% uh, efficiency and the expensive ones have up to 20% efficiency. Uh, the number of solar power plants in Slovenia is 3,336. The production of electricity from solar energy in 2012 was 1% of total electricity production in Slovenia. And did you know that if we would cover Sahara with solar cells, we would get we would get 40 times more of electric energy that the whole world needs. The problem is just power transmission over long distances. So that's it about solar energy. Thank you for listening. Now, um, do you guys have your own topics, or do we just I don't know? Do we switch between each other's topics, or? Oh, yeah. Um, is it fine if I ask? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, uh, so why do you think alternative energies have not caught on yet? We didn't understand. Can you repeat the question? Why do you think alternative energies have not caught on yet? Because of the money. I think the problem is money. Yeah, it's really expensive. Um, 
another one is, on April 26, it will be the 30th anniversary of Chernobyl. Do you think that nuclear is the way to go? Now that's my topic. Nuclear is the way to go, I don't know. Well, it depends. We need way more research to be done. For example, sure, it's nice, it's clean, it generates 20,000 times more power than coal. But still, when it goes boom, it goes boom in a pretty nasty way. So I'm not so hyped about that one. Nope, not at all. So, in the U.S., gas is cheaper today than it was in 1972, less tax and inflation. Is this helping or hunting, uh, hurting alternative fuels? Well, I'm a good economy, so yes, it is certainly hurting the uh, alternative fuels. Of course, you know, the other day, um, a bag of coal is cheaper than a solar panel and probably produces more power for one hour of running. I guess. So yeah, it, it is definitely hurting it, as well as cheap oil prices too. And the thing is, down in the rocky bottom, oh yeah. Um, another one is, um, why have gas companies not been the leaders in changing uh, over from gas if we were truly running out? Good question. I guess it's just that the system is currently rolling in the direction and to stop it, it could require a lot of money, a lot of nerves, a lot of it would really not be gave. Because let's face it, more money, better for us. Why spend it if it keeps rolling in? That's the economy. Gotta love it. Um, I'll go ahead and start now. So in the Cold War, uh, the doubt, it's an analogy, but the Dallas Cowboys were America's team, and now they were consistently good, and they were led by one larger-than-life coach, Tom Landry. He coached the Dallas Cow Cowboys until February 1989, when a 46-year-old oil man, Jerry Jones, bought the Dallas Cow Cowboys and fired Tom Landry, the only, the only coach that Dallas had ever had. Shortly thereafter, Russia fell, apar fell apart, and so did the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas is no longer America's team. The USSR no longer exists, yet the story proves our point. It is cause and effect argument. Dallas Cowboys' image changed when Jerry Jones brought the team, yet Jerry Jones did not cause the breakup of the USSR, only the breakup of the Dallas Cowboys. The same goes for this debate today. Oil is not running out, and in fact, today, oil today, March 2016, was cheaper, minus the taxes and inflation, than it was in 1972. Oil has changed the way we live, work, eat, and even play. And there is not one aspect of our life that is not touched by oil. Getting rid of oil would be like getting rid of Jerry Jones. People may want to do it, but no one has figured out a way to do it yet. Because oil is really the fuel that runs the world, all of the alternatives to oil uh, are not a great replacement uh, to fit under it. And they could work on a limited basis or an individual family, but not on a grid system. Take, for example, electric cars. Um, it would take more gasoline to fuel electric cars when you add up the gas in the tank and the gas to generate the electricity than a regular gas car. So by converting to electric cars, we would actually use more gas, not less. And this is the same with wind power. Uh, wind power, um, well, wind energy is inter intermittent and unreliable for the following nine reasons. Uh, one of them is it will generate electricity on its schedule and not the needs of the actual electric uh, grid. And uh, another one is, uh, two is new wind electric uh, generation is currently only competitive because of government rebates. Uh, three, wind energy requires subs substantial reverse conventional uh, generation backup for times when wind may not be blowing and the cost of backup power generation is not included in the wind proponents' cost estimates. Uh, four, the cost of transmission lines is often not included in the cost. Locations are, that are good for wind electric generation typically are a great distance from the consumers of electricity. Uh, five, the megawatt capacity ratings for wind turbines can be misleading. It is a maximum power output rating uh, wind generators generally are only able to generate over a year's uh, period a maximum of 30% of the electricity indicated by its capacity rating. 
uh, seven, extensive installation of wind turbines could hurt or our balance of trade. Many of the wind generators are built overseas and the turbines represent 70% of the installed cost. Eight, wind turbines are viewed uh, not very eye-catching by eyesores uh, by many citizens. Uh, nine, they are danger to birds. There have been many documented instances of birds being killed by the moving blades. Ten, if global warming is a priori priority, nuclear power plants can provide power without generating greenhouse gases. And eleven, wind turbine turbines uh, located offshore can be hazard to ships on land, and they are oftentimes hazards to uh, birds and insects as well. Now, if we take the American Wind Energy Association's claim that sixty thousand megawatts of wind energy capacity can reduce carbon dioxide, dioxide emissions by about 80 million tons per year. And simple math shows that if we wanted to stop the growth in global carbon dioxide emissions by using wind energy alone, we would have to install about 3,375, uh, yes, uh, three, uh, 375,000 uh, megawatts of new wind energy capacity every year. If we assume each each turbine has a capacity of two megawatts. That would mean installing 187,500 wind turbines every year or nearly 500 every day. Now, how much land would all those wind turbines require? Again, the math is straightforward. The power density of wind energy is one watt per square meter. Therefore, merely halting the growth in carbon dioxide emissions with wind energy would require uh, covering land about 375 billion square meters or 375,000 square kilometers, an area the size of Germany, and we would have to do so every year. So what would that mean on a daily basis? Using wind alone to stop the growth in carbon dioxide emissions would require us to cover about 1,000 square kilometers with wind turbines and a land area about 17 times the, si the size of the Manhattan Island and we would have to do so every day. Given the ongoing black uh, backlash against the wind industry that is already underway here in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia, the silliness of such proposal is obvious. Now, um, the punchline here is equally obvious. If we are going to agree that carbon dioxide is a problem, then we must embrace the technologies that are most effective at reducing our production of that gas. As Hanson, Wiggly, and their colleagues point out, that means nuclear. And while the climate scientists don't m mention methane, uh, we are also going to have uh, to use lots of natural gas, gas, as that's the only other fuel that can su supplant significant amounts of, of coal. Over the past few years, the U.S. and other countries have been subsidizing the paving of vast areas of the countryside with 500-foot hybrid and uh, backling whirl whirl uh, whirlings, and that are nothing more than climate tells talismans. Uh, wind turbines are not going to stop changes in the Earth's climate. Instead, there are token gestures, giant steel scarecrows that are deceiving the public into thinking that uh, we as society are doing something to avert the possibility of catastrophic climate change. Uh, some of the cons of wind energy, as we previously mentioned, uh, harnessing wind power via turbines is a great source of clean power and is increasingly um, in integral to our rapidly warming climate, but it's not um, now, there are some very uh, negative aspects to it, some of which are merely inconvenient and others which are down, uh, downright harmful, all of which we, we will mention, uh, I will mention now. So one of them is that they're noisy. Now, if you've ever noticed that wind turbines only stand in places where there's not a lot of people, normally it's not because there's more wind there, it's because there's wind in a lot of places. Um, it is, it's because the machinery found inside the turbine is loud when operating. As a result of keeping these uh, bothersome machines away from residential areas, as well as places of work, these turbines are uh, relegated only to the most uh, desolate of places. And two, they actually do threaten uh, wildfire, wildlife. And while there may not be a large or even existent human population near the wind turbines, there certainly is bound to be a thriving population of wildlife in the area. While these imposing structures may not necessarily affect the grazing wildlife that shares the land with the turbines, it's the animals in the sky and underground are not so lucky. Birds in these areas, especially ones that migrate every year, like old eagles and tilt hawks, have a tendency to fly into the blades, with studies showing about 45,000 birds 
uh, having perished over the last 20 years due to these turbines. Underground habitats uh, tend to ne negatively affect it as, uh, as well when these turbines are installed as a result of deep digging that is necessary for them. And three, wind is unpredictable. Once these turbines are installed, they must wait for the wind to pick up in order to be effective. Um, and this is a completely unpredictable process. Granted, a lot of research is done to ensure that the turbines are put into excessively windy areas. That doesn't guarantee anything. And sometimes other energy sources must be employed to take up the slack, such as solar or geothermal. And for a limited resource, unlike solar energy, whose um, the source is found in every part of the world, when energy is only able to be harnessed when there is no wind available, which is not as widely found um, as one might first expect. This fact, along with the need to put them in unpopulated regions, greatly limits the potential areas where turbines can be installed. For these machines to be as useful as possible, they must be put on flat lands uh, and or coastal places. Um, five, eye source. While some people usually don't, those that don't live in the areas of these turbines think they are majestic and beautiful to look at. Others find them to be less attractive and even detrimental to the physical beauty of the surrounding areas. And some have even taken to sending around petitions to er eradicate these turbines in their community. Uh, six, inefficient. Sure, wind energy is clean, but it certainly isn't efficient. When converting the wind energy into usable electric energy, the machinery within the turbines only is are only able to extract extract about 59% of the wind's power. Uh, this, this seems to be one of the major issues with using wind energy, and it's, this efficiency appears to be remaining static at the moment, which with little no to no improvements in this area on the horizon. Seven, storage issues. Going along with the point of turbines being inefficient, they're unable to store converted energy in large amounts, being that wind only comes in fits and starts in order to be efficient, the turbines would need to store up these bursts of wind energy to be truly effective. But because they can't, they're not as efficient as they may seem uh, to be. Eight, blind occupation. We've mentioned before, and surely you've already noticed that while, while wind turbine doesn't occupy that large of an actual piece of land, uh, it's necessary to put many turbines on a large tract of land for them to be able as effective and helpful as possible. In other words, in other words, you'll never see just one or two wind turbines in one place. Again, this land is still usable once they're installed, but taking as one large group, they do occupy a large uh, piece of land. Nine, poor television reception. While efforts are made to install these uh, in less populated regions, chances are there's going to be a few people around, and even better chances that are most all of them uh, will have television turbines are so large and imposing that they actually affect local television and radio sign signals in a negative way. And 10, installation costs. As you can imagine, installing um, a group of these huge turbines can cost a lot of money. Installing just one of them can be as pricey as two million or more, with more costs uh, for maintenance. Another cost in installing a turbine is less a uh, monetary issue as it is an environmental one. These The production, transport, and installation of one of these Turbines has a sizable carbon footprint, which is important to know, especially considering that the whole idea behind its construction uh, is for clean power. And um, <clears throat> so uh, all our, our alternatives to current energy have problems, and three main problems are uh, the pollution, the cost, and it cannot produce enough energy. Um, so, Nuclear power, um, um, uh, the costs are very large. Uh, nuclear waste created and uh, potential hazards and hydropower is limited, are as um, limited potential. And, uh, yeah. yes. Well done. Nice work. That was very interesting. Now, I believe that it's Archer, unless anybody here has any questions. No, no questions. Wonderful. Good job. Now I believe it's my colleagues who are here to explain about their source of power. So if I move this wonderful little microphone like this, I hope it's right, I got no idea, and take it away boys. Yeah, hi, I'm Sebastian and this is Alesh. Um, he is going to tell you about the pros about wind turbine power and then I'm going to tell you more about the cons. So, 
Right, uh, in Slovenia we only have two wind turbines. In the future we are planning to build more along the coast of Slovenia. Uh, wind turbines provide a clean power source without polluting uh, the air. Uh, they are simplistic technology. Uh, wind turbines work without producing any waste and are easy to build. They are also cheap to build and low maintenance cost. In the area in which they are constructed, they can still use the land for farming. <clears throat> and the cons would be that wind doesn't always blow consistently. Like some days it will blow a lot, some days it wouldn't blow at all. Uh, and the turbines typically operate at only 30% capacity, which is wrong. Um, severe storms or extremely high winds might cause damage to your wind turbine, especially when they're struck by lightning. The blades of the wind turbines can sometimes be dangerous for wildlife, particularly birds. Uh, wind turbines create a sound that averages around 60 decibels, and if you don't have enough space to locate it away from your house, it may prove to be a nuisance. And some people believe that wind turbines are unattractive, so your neighbors may complain. Oh. Oh, well, looks like that's it. Um, have you guys got any more topics to introduce to this debate here? Um, no. Well, then I guess I'm going to take the floor myself. Unless there are any questions, I don't think so. No, uh, no uh, go ahead. Well, then, let me just move this wonderful little mic of mine, like this, funny little thing. Now, me and my friend here, we got nuclear power. This is quite a big one. Now, I'm sure that many of you remember the good old days when nuclear power was the magical energy source powering the world of the future. From flying cars to household robots, nuclear energy was the miracle solution which paved the path of science fiction fanatics everywhere. And even today, it's marketed as an alternative to traditional sources such as, but not limited to, coal, for example, gas, oil, everything really. Yet as time went on, people's interest in flying cars, unfortunately, went down. And alongside their interest in nuclear energy, more environmentally friendly sources were coming into market and gaining traction. There's also a consistent fear of a nuclear disaster, such as the one seen in Chernobyl, which impacts the area till this day. And today, right now, I will undertake the task of looking back at our old friend, the nuclear power plant. And I will try to see if it still holds its dominance in the alternative energy source department. Does the nuclear power plant's profits and environmental benefits outweigh the risks involving? And does it outweigh other sources? Well, the thing is that nuclear power plants are a very long-term project, which are risky for investors. Currently, the situation is making investors rather, rather short-sighted, for you see, the alternatives to nuclear power are looking very attractive at the moment. In the global market, the cost for oil is incredibly, incredibly low. And at the time of writing, I have yet to see any sign of oil's value increasing. We all know that oil supply is limited, but at this moment, it appears that the world is overflowing with it. So looking at other more popular sources of energy, such as coal and gas, we may see that their value is in fact rising these days. Yet that still poses little trouble to our friend, the nuclear power plant, because it is very, very expensive. As a matter of fact, when we look at the fact that building of them takes a couple of years on its own, the cost, well, about two thirds of the costs that come with nuclear power plants are due to the initial cost of the construction. This alone is a troubling fact for investors as other power plants, such as coal, are rather cheap to build when compared with the nuclear power plant. But what about the remaining third? That part consists of everything else from maintenance to the fuel itself, most commonly being uranium. Thing is that nuclear power sources, or basically any type of fuel with mash in there, are rather cheap when compared to coal. As a matter of fact, a single unit of nuclear power sources can produce about 20,000 well, I'm saying 20, times more energy than an equally large unit of, for example, coal. As a matter of fact, about half of the costs related to nuclear fuel are there due to the processing, which uranium must undertake before it can be used in a power plant. 
In long term, nuclear power plants do come with a high initial cost, but after that, the cost of running them is significantly lower, much lower than the one of coal or gas, whose price has been increasing much more than the one of nuclear power sources. While environmentally, the nuclear power plant does not produce any carbon dioxide on its own, and it is looking like a better solution uh, to a carbon-free environment. But now let's address the wonderful elephant in the room, the fact that we have absolutely no clue on how to store or dispose of nuclear waste. We simply don't. Either we store it in a storage area or we bury it deep underground. Well, just like everything connected to nuclear stuff, the world's solution is simply to sweep it under the carpet. Another example is the modern day Chernobyl, which you previously mentioned. Their plan with the unstable nuclear core is to build a giant hard cover or dome over the entire core and seal it from the world only to be reopened after 100 years. The uncovering of which is, in my opinion, the perfect science fiction or horror movie scenario. Given all this, the interesting question is what does the public think about nuclear reactors? After quickly looking it up, it appears that the public's opinion is rather split throughout the world with some variations, with the two major variations being Europe and America. Europe's opinion is very negative towards nuclear energy, while America's opinion is rather positive. And while the approval rating in Europe is heavily declining, it's been rather stable in America for many, many years, despite the fact there is a small minor decline. As a matter of fact, Germany is in the process of shutting down all of their nuclear reactors within the following years. You're in closing down some of the French reactors, they're nuts. And now in my personal opinion, I would prioritize researching on how to deal with nuclear waste and how to protect us from fallouts in general, or better yet, just send the entire thing back to the lab for a couple of years. And now my colleague here will answer some of the questions which were given to us. Or why I answer the questions I forgot? No. Oh yeah, looks like I forgot. I'm going to answer the questions. Hooray. So starting with the investment into nuclear power, I'll spare you the numbers and just say that it's very expensive. There is a lot of money involved in the nuclear business, especially when building the reactors since more of them are being built around the world and their cost is increasing as it is. Should we invest more in this technology? Yes, we definitely need to invest more into research regarding nuclear waste and protection against this deadly radiation. Just that we should invest in pretty much any other kind of alternative technology. And what is the latest scientific advancement in the field? A good week ago, I saw a headline about a new kind of protective material which could help us reduce radiation and protect us from meltdowns. I tried to find this article. I failed. Sorry. There should be over 100 operating nuclear power plants in the US as well. In Europe, there are 185 nuclear power plants since early February this year. And the fourth question, in 2014, 19.5% of all electricity generated in the US came from nuclear power plants. The same year, there were 13 countries in the world who relied on nuclear power to supply at least one quarter of their power, ours being at number eight with 37.2. We don't have a lot of power plants, we're just really that small. And all of which is being produced by a single power plant, which is even being shared with our neighbors in Croatia. What economics factors do we limit its expansion? Simply put, the high and still increasing price to build a reactor and the long amount of time that it takes for the investors to receive profits from it. As long-term investments may be rather profitable, but anything can happen in the future. And the plan being a physical thing which can break down or burn down, or collapse, explode. Well, basically the disasters carry some pretty big financial sinkholes and insurance companies don't even like insuring nuclear power plants. If something goes to hell, they can't even pay for it. So what are the current political factors limiting nuclear power plants? Well, it's simply the fear of that something going boom. Well, people don't trust the technology as well, don't like it. So if people don't like it, governments don't like it. And politicians tell the people what they want to hear and get back wonderful free votes in return. It's also the fact that a nuclear power plant is a prime target for terrorism and that the public really likes to see wind turbines and solar panels these days. And now I think I'm going to give the pros and cons to my colleague here. Um, it generates uh, power uh, with nearly no carbon dioxide. Um, we, we can put it in vehicles such as submarines, energy produced is independent from conditions such as the weather, 
Mm -hmm. um, it can reproduce energy seven, seven um, days a week. Um, every accident so far happened due to human error. Um, due to our research, we can build nuclear power, power plants nearly everywhere, but the ideal location is near a river. Um, and some of the cons are incredibly high initial construction costs, danger of nuclear disasters, um, no way to dispose of nuclear waste apart from storing it and burying it. As of now, it's truly renewable as uranium must be dug up and it is also in it. Not to mention that what comes out of it goes to storage as nuclear waste until we learn some magical way to dispose or reuse the nuclear waste that is. And, it, and like you said, it's a prime target for terrorism. Um, in Slovenia, we do have a nuclear power plant in Kursko. It began construction in 1975. It was a joint project in Yugoslavia. Um, the, um, Slovenia does um, hold half of the power. Half it's went went to half 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 of the power goes to Croatia. Um, the power generated is somewhere between 700 megawatts. Um, there was a coolant leak in the year 2008, which did scare a lot of people in Slovenia and also around Europe. Um, it, um, it has a retirement date of 2032, um, which I don't know if they plan to reopen a new one. Wonderful. Well, there you have it, folks. Nuclear energy in a nutshell. It appears like it's not slowing down anytime soon. If I could sum it up, I'd say it's like a glass cannon. Fires cannonballs like an absolute beast, but easy to break and clean up as painful and hard and radiates. So I don't need to research to make it safe to use. We use something else. There's also the third option, which includes a shovel and a gas mask, but I don't want to get just there. And with that, I can conclude our segment here. Any questions whatsoever regarding the topic? Uh, yes. So did you help or hurt the nuclear interest industry? Uh, could you repeat that question? Uh, we couldn't hear you that well. Did Chernobyl help or help or hurt the nuclear industry? Oh, well, of course it hurt nuclear industry. After all, every industry is dependent on the public, what the public thinks. And having a big explosion whose effects were felt quite a large distance away from Chernobyl, as a matter of fact, the whole part of Europe was affected by it, it definitely hindered nuclear energy as it is. Oh, yeah. For more than two years. Uh, why do people not want to live by uh, near uh, nuclear plants? Well, simple, isn't it? Do you want to live next to a big bomb, which can pretty much decimate the entire area? I don't think so. Neither do I. As a matter of fact, I mean, like our we use smartphones, uh, Television signals were pretty much as radiated as it gets, and I do not need a nuclear power plant next to my front door. Uh, if Iran and Saudi Arabia keep on pumping oil, will not gas prices remain low uh, for a long time to come? Why, certainly. Oil is so cheap at this moment that your product, where it sounds, well, basically, oil is so cheap that when something like oil is so cheap, Competitive sources such as gas must reduce their price to match public's interest. So yeah, definitely everything will be rather cheap for the next few years. God, I hope oil runs out soon. Uh, what is the cost of gas in Slovenia today? That's a good question. I don't know. Coffee benzina. It's quite expensive. It's really expensive. Good answer. It's expensive. <laughs> um, so how has uh, our energy policies impacted mass migrations of people? Well, that's a good question. To be honest, I don't think it's energy policies, uh, policies that impacted the migration. 
It's simply the economic situation of the countries in which people are migrating to. Energy politics are just a byproduct of a successful society. Um, so, um, what about um, how has our energy um, policies impacted our, uh, let's say, foreign policies? Good question. Well, if a successful country has great policies, then certainly other countries will look up to them as an example. That's pretty much it. Like, we look up to them, we see, oh, that's beautiful, they got this big reactor, it's so pretty. Do we have the money to build our own? No, but we like to. That's all there is to it. Uh, how does ISIS make its money? <laughs> Wonderful. ISIS, that's a good question. Well, people have speculated that ISIS is trading oil with Turkey. That's a very good reason. Otherwise, ISIS kind of runs like a state. You know, they call themselves the Islamic State. They want to take over a lot of territory and basically create their own Islamic country. So, yeah, this is going to be a difficult question, but certainly from oil and from oppression from people and Definitely other illegal acts. No, I have no doubt in that. Now here I have a list of questions for you guys. What source of energy do you, do you guys use in your homes? For example, heating, cooking, or washing? Uh, well, the most common one uh, usually um, that's uh, being used is, uh, of course, electric, um, electric energy or, yeah, it's just... Uh, the most uh, common and yeah, here in, in Texas it's electric and uh, we have three different major uh, sources of uh, how they create our electric power uh, we have some lignite mines where it's uh, lignite coal used we also have some other coal generated but the majority of ours is uh, gasoline uh, it's a gasoline they burn the gasoline to create the electricity Interesting to hear. Didn't know Texas had coal mines. Um, but do you guys speculate that, well, do you guys spec which power source do you guys think could, for example, take over the majority in America? Uh, because like which could become the most popular? Because of the size of our land, you know, like Texas is almost 270,000 square miles. And it's about 700 miles from east to west and maybe 650 miles north to south. And just the sheer size uh, of the United States pretty much precludes any one uh, thing to take over electric uh, transmission because everything that has a, a, a diminishing law of returns to where, like, we have uh, – I traveled up to see my mother uh, about a month ago in Oklahoma, and they have a line of, um, we have a, a tremendous wind farms about 50 miles from where our school is located in Marble Falls. And then we have a, another line of uh, wind farms that go, uh, when you go into Oklahoma, and uh, you'll see them every once in a while, but wind could not uh, occupy enough to take over. We have two nuclear power plants here in Texas. Uh, both are very similar to what you were saying. People didn't want to live by them and, you know, different spirits and stuff like that. They couldn't produce enough uh, power. Uh, Texas in the 1970s and 80s went to lignite uh, because gasoline, they thought, you know, was running out at that point. And uh, then since we started fracking and we started doing other means of uh, – that we've had our own boom here in the oil industry. Uh, in 1973 or 72, I guess, the United States was leader in the world in as far as producing oil. And then we went way down. And then in 2014, we were back up again, uh, simply because Texas was uh, leading the United States in production of oil. I think about 55 to 60% of all the oil comes from, from Texas. And now since oil has gone down uh, a lot per barrel, uh, we see the negative impacts here in Texas as well. 
interesting, I have to say. Well, is there anything else either from you or from my colleagues here? Now, what you, uh, I could ask the same back to you on Slovenia. Uh, Slovenia seems like to be being smaller, more compact, would still have some uh, abilities to do alternative energy, but with your mountains and, and hills and different things like that, doesn't that impact what you could actually spread out for transmission uh, for different sources? Well, mountains and hills, yes, they certainly do have an impact when it comes to transmission because, for example, in the hills, you most commonly simply see like poles with wires. Otherwise, when it comes to actual sources itself, I gotta say we're not so renewable, to be honest. There are plenty of coal power plants around here. Like I said, one nuclear power plant covering 30% of the country. Otherwise, yeah, it's mostly coal. We do have a, two wind turbines, that's an achievement. That's pretty much it, to be honest. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I guess it really does impact us. Mm -hmm. What type of coal, because uh, we're, we're fairly warm here. We didn't have a freeze this winter for our, our winter. So most people, they may have gas as a backup, but we don't have too much coal at all. How much would it cost to heat a house in Slovenia during the winter time with coal? Um, um, like we use thermo, thermo, thermo. Mm -hmm. uh, we use wood. Yeah, oh. we use wood for heating. Almost all of the houses in Slovenia use wood for heating, and like uh, we have um, for one winter, we my family use about I don't know like wood for about 400 500 uh, euros which like about 400 dollars something like that and let's not forget a lot of houses have oil yeah. as a heating source as a backup otherwise i guess when it comes to price you know we got a lot of forests what isn't that expensive yeah. so is oil oil is relatively cheap right now so yeah when it comes to the numbers that i have no clue i don't do the accounting yet I ask, that's fairly inexpensive for a whole season of heating to get alternative energy down that it's not near would be compatible comparable with that is it I mean people still do that because it's it's relatively expensive and, and fairly convenient correct right? Well, that's a good question. I'd have to say that currently, the way it is, it's pretty good. There's not a lot of interest in other alternative sources, to be honest. I mean, sure, a couple of windmills wouldn't kill anybody, unless some workers perhaps were. Yeah. Oh, and also biomass. Biomass here is the cheapest source of power. Some houses do have, in fact, a lot of uh, solar. I guess solar panels on top, otherwise it's still fairly expensive here. But would, wouldn't you say that most of that would be on the individual basis, like somebody may would have a, a individual biomass converter or maybe a community type converter or maybe they have a windmill in your yard or maybe have solar panels, but not for a city or certainly not for a country, correct? Yeah, this is mostly for an individual basis because uh, here's the deal. Our cities aren't really like what you guys want to find as cities. They're, we the U.S. would call them towns, I guess, you know, still kind of small. Yeah. So uh, I, I can't really say what's uh, like in cities. Of course, uh, over there, it's mostly all convenient energy sources, generators. Um, when it comes to individuals, well, like I said, it varies from the individual, of course, but mostly wood, oil, and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, on this Earth Day today, what do you think is the greatest thing we should get from this exercise? Hmm, well, that's a good question. Hmm. Hmm? Yeah, we should definitely increase our use of alternative energy and a lot more research. And that's the most important part. 
we got all this stuff, it's already there, but it needs to be better. You know, it needs to be competitive with, with coal. So yeah, a lot more research. Now, I agree with you, but let me try to put in a second. Who is going to do the research? Because in the United States, most of the research on coal is done by the coal companies. Most of the research on nuclear power is done by nuclear power companies. And you don't really get like true research research that's independent. Is that the same in Slovenia? Well, over here, I guess companies don't play such a large role. So if there's a, like a research institute or something like that, it's probably funded by the government, to be honest. But when it comes to worldwide, I have to say that, well, certainly we should, the world should create some sort of, I guess, a worldwide institute of science, if you might. Otherwise, again, this is all politics and money, which is fairly unpredictable these days. Oh, yeah, and there's $20. Unfortunately, I, I kind of think that once you get politics involved, and here in the States, you get these companies that pay these lobbyists a tremendous amount of money, and then they try to just pass their bills to their advantage, and that's where you end up seeing a lot of these programs that don't make a whole lot of sense somewhere down the road, but it has to do with money, and it just so happens that the coal industry has a large lobby group, the nuclear power industry has a large lobby group, Solar power people have a large lobby group. I don't know who is really the lobby group for the people to get the honest information. I don't know if that's the same. In, you know, the same as our. Thank you. But the problem is that Slovenia is so small. We don't have um, companies that are, that are large as are in Texas. Um, we probably have for us a big company um, has like I don't know about uh, 10,000 people employed and for you probably like 100 and um, the problem is that our uh, companies don't own that much money that much amount of money so we we have to so we have to uh, wait for the government and when it comes to lobbying and research, people should definitely trust anything that isn't founded by anybody who has stakes in such a business. For example, if a research saying I should drink more Coca-Cola is being funded by the soda company, I wouldn't find it very legitimate, although I'd still drink more Coca-Cola. That is not a question. Okay, speaking about Coca-Cola, since you brought it up, does your Coca-Cola have high fructose corn syrup in it, or does it have regular sugar? Um, no, not really. Um, if we're talking about Coca-Cola, the product in general, it all comes imported and then it's, I guess, it's kind of like a, a, a paste, condensed, I guess it's bottled in, a, I believe in Bosnia, something like that. So it's pretty much identical to yours. Um, otherwise, when it comes to knockoff brands, we do have one brand uh, historically and that one had a, a bit more lemon. Yeah, a bit more of a lemony taste. It's quite interesting. To give you a little history of Coca-Cola, uh, Coca-Cola was originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a patent medicine uh, for stomach problems, and then uh, it became a, a soda, you know, right around during our time of prohibition. But what's kind of strange is that the number one company, country in the world to produce our Coca-Cola is not the United States anymore. You know what country it is? No, not, not really. That's surprising, actually. Uh, Mexico produces more Coca-Cola than the United States, and one of the reasons why a lot of people think that, or uh, think that's the reason, is because they still use natural sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. It's quite a controversy over that. It's also quite a controversy in the United States about GMO products and stuff. I don't think you're allowed GMO products in Slovenia, are you? Nope, European and luckily our standards are pretty strict on GMO. Every product containing the slightest amount has to be visibly and clearly marked using European standards. So, nope, we're still pretty good. Uh, you, guys are, you guys are leading a lot better than, than we are on that. 
And I, I would like to ask one other question. Has your country been touched much by the mass uh, migration of like Syrian and other refugees coming through Turkey into uh, the Southeastern Europe? Ah, uh, this one is right up my angle. Well, uh, we made a big effort and at our borders we made this big sign, an arrow, which says this way to Germany. Uh, jokes aside, we are basically a transit country. Uh, most migrants pass through our countries. We organize transport with buses uh, to the Austrian border where the Austrians take it forward. Um, so to be honest, no, we, we haven't been really touched. And uh, to be honest, I am not complaining, not the slightest bit. She is yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the amount of people requesting asylum is only 60, which is quite low, and it's nice. You guys are doing a good job, it, 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 which I was trying to hint at when uh, Cecilia was asking that question. You know, if you look at the overarching idea behind this, I do believe that our energy policies are dictating that we are in the uh, wars in the Middle East that we may not should be belonging in, into, and that's causing a lot of problems, which it ends up resulting in mass migration. Do you, you see that to be the case or no? Hmm, good question. Wars, uh, yeah, I guess wars really spiked up that whole area. Oh, yes. Um, when it comes to energy, I don't really think it made that much of an impact. I mean, it certainly drove down the prices of oil for the American people. Otherwise, I don't think so. If anything, it's only spiked the world's war industry. So I guess that's the only good benefit we have from it, not the guys down there. Those guys are probably burning in Nepal. Yeah, yeah it, it's horrible. You know, it, I, I could just imagine living in a country like that would it'd be really you know, horrible all, all together. Uh, one more quick question about your, your particular political uh, situation in Slovenia. How is, how is Slovenia today compared to when Marshal Tito was, and you guys were part of uh, Yugoslavia? How, how does it compare uh, with uh, energy and other policies today as a free country compared to when it used to be part of Yugoslavia? Well, I have the pleasure of answering this one again. It's better, uh, I, I guess. I mean, we separated for the better. To be honest, policy-wise, we're quite working with European Union. We're presidential republic. Huh? Yeah, well, under Tito, as my teacher here states, everybody had a job. I guess that was socialism. Everybody had a car. Everybody was pretty much equal. And the economic crisis touched us pretty heavily these days. Uh, a lot of people got hit really bad, but so I guess in a sense of equality, it was a lot better. Everybody was taken care of, but in the sense of beautiful capitalism, which we enjoy today, we were not as wealthy as we might have been today. Is Tito apparently also made a lot of uh, debts, which is why it all went downhill. Okay, is energy cheaper today? Even though it costs a little bit more, is it cheaper than it was when it, when it, you guys were communists or no? Or has your energy policy changed much? Not uh, No, it isn't. It's not cheaper. Yeah. Because ours actually is cheaper than it was in, uh, about 40 years ago now. We've got in April, it was it, it hit a point where they raised ta taxes on the gas, but they raised taxes. Uh, if you take away the taxes and inflation, gasoline was cheaper than it was pre nineteen seventy three oil embargo day. That's what's killing a lot of all our alternative energy here in the states is that because it's so it's so uh, inexpensive to use gasoline or natural gas that, uh, and it looks like it's going to be that way in the foreseeable future. There's no real future in alternatives when they can't really make a profit out of it. So, you know, compared to maybe 10 years ago, the future appears to be 
10 years ago when peak oil was a, a really big uh, thing and everybody was arguing that we're going to be running out of oil in, in the near foreseeable future, there were a lot of people jumping all over uh, trying to get into anything green in energy. Or even at the beginning of the Obama administration, you know, if you say kind of green energy, you can make a tremendous amount of money. Well, today, as the Obama administration is, is – uh, approaching its last final years, a year, or six months or eight months, whatever it is, uh, it appears that alternative energy is taking a big back step simply because the, the cost of oil is going to be historically low for a, a near foreseeable future. What do you see alternative energy's future in the next five years? We got a question coming in here, which is how much that a single, I guess, a, an average full tank of gas for a car, not an actual tank, cost? Oh, okay. Oh, so like uh, right now, um, it's a dollar eighty nine uh, for. Yeah, it's it's pretty cheap. And so you can fill up your tank for about thirty dollars if you if you have a, if you have fifteen gallon tank you can fill up your tank for about twenty six dollars. Uh, in March it hit a historic low here. It was about forty five cents cheaper in Austin. In some places it had gotten down to like a dollar twenty, and that was and then by the time you add the extra taxes and stuff on it, it would be like. A, equivalent to maybe 1960s, 17 cents a gallon, uh, gallon. it was really inexpensive. So uh, except for about the last month when gas has a, has a spike, you could almost fill up, I filled up my tank in three weeks ago for, uh, I had a 15 gallon tank, I filled it up for uh, $19.95. Uh, what about electrical cars in America? Are they, I guess, widespread already? I mean, Tesla's making some big turns, but if you go outside, do you see people using electrical cars at all? That's one thing Cecilia was mentioning in her speech. Electrical car actually takes more gasoline than a gasoline car. Yeah, we heard that part. Um, I was wondering whether not if it takes more, if there actually are cars on the road. For example, if you go outside, you see a lot of people or even a couple of people driving around in electric cars. The amount of cars, not the amount of gas they use. No, I understand what you're saying. I would just say... Uh, you, you'd see a couple, not, not very much, just a few. Yeah, you, you don't see a whole lot here because the average person here in Austin, to give you an idea, we, we live in a community, we live kind of in the rural side of... Of a, of a metropolitan area and the average person in our there is public transportation is it's here but very few people use it and the majority of people would probably travel 20 30 thousand miles a year in a car pretty easily they may travel 50 miles to go to work back and forth a day and then the time you go grocery shopping the same so over a period of a year, they could go 15 and go to church. You know, it, it's not like it's right next door or anything. So uh, a lot of people do not like the not – they like gasoline because it's much more flexible in the use. Uh, I've noticed that most of our shopping centers now will have electric plug-ins for electric cars to, to do that. Cecilia it could probably tell you more about it. But you will see maybe one to a hundred or something like that here in Texas. Now, in some areas where they travel much less and uh, everything is so close, they may would have an electric car. Because uh, if you don't go too too terribly far, electric cars are maybe a, a pretty good investment. But they do. Tesla does sell an awful lot of cars here in the uh, in the states, and we sell a lot of the deals like the. Uh, uh, the combined, you know, the uh, part electric and part uh, 
Yeah, there's, uh, there's uh, different ones that um, I've personally seen from uh, actually been in one and stuff. And uh, there was a solar panel. There was a solar panel one, which is pretty cool. And there was also an electric one. And um, yeah, they're not they're not very common yet. Um, just a few so fun. Probably more out east than where we're at. Well, certainly interesting to hear. Well, is there anything else either from your side or from our side? No. Uh, minute. Okay. Um, our teacher wants to know, does your school have a class which would be centered about environment, well, basically concerning, concerned about the environment, you know, about renewable energy, something like that? Uh, yes, we have, uh, there is an environmental uh, science class and uh, uh, that's basically what it focuses on, uh, just uh, the outside world and um, basically environments. Uh. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure if what we're trying to teach the kids is not much more than what political leaders kind of want them to know, not necessarily engaging people in actual uh, Discourse of knowledge. Yeah, politics. You gotta love them. Yeah. No choice. Our, uh, our education systems heavily evolved in politics here in the states. How about yours? I don't think so much. No, not really. Our education system is not so centered on politics. It's uh, really centered. Well, basically, we try to. I guess imitate, you know, we're really influenced by other European countries, for example, those in the north. Otherwise, no, we're, we're doing pretty good, if you ask me. And how many years do you go to high school? Well, a uh, student can go to high school for about four years. This is our program, the economics technician. Uh, those guys here uh, go to uh, high school for three years, although they can extend their, uh, I guess, time here for two years to get some advanced stuff. The gymnasium program, which is an all-around encompassing wonder program, is also four years. And then we go forward to college or higher school, it's called or whatnot, university, yeah. Are you, are you basically like the old Soviet system where most of the people graduate after 11th grade after taking a series of tests? No, not, not really. A lot of people tend to choose the four-year program these days. Or the gymnasium, it's incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. That sounds really neat. It sounds like you have a lot better options than we do. We, we are much more limited in, in that respect. And let me ask you a couple quick questions. How, if, if I was going to ask these problems, could, could you tell me a little bit about what is your social economic breakup when it comes to your students at the school, uh, are they all in the same type of uh, look? Okay, I don't want to put it back there. In our in our particular school now, the majority of our students are low social economic. About ninety some percent of our students uh, can apply for free and reduced lunch. Uh, we've noticed that in the states, it seems like instead of getting more and more better off, we're getting students who are less better off. Does that make some sense? Is that the same in Slovenia or not? Um, kind, kind of. I think in university, um, it depends on what, uh, on the, what in the university we think we want to go, uh, but on average, I don't think so, uh, because uh, if you want to get to some college, uh, they, um, the people there are looking for grades, not the money or from where you are, from where you come from. So I don't think so. Um, it it is involved a little bit. Um, depends what professors or what school, uh, but no. What, what no, no scholarship, actually. No scholarship. Okay, I said this. 
And there's also no scholarship here, meaning that anybody can go everywhere, which is just wonderful. Although we do have high taxes. No fees. Yes, no scholarship here. No fees. Oh, really? Oh. Okay, it's not scholarship. There are school fees. Apparently, the journal school fees here. Yeah, we do have scholarship, just no fees. It's basically all, all inclusive. Just pay a lot of taxes, like a lot of taxes. It's, it's really, really, really scary. Right, so it doesn't cost any money to go to high school or college there? Uh, could you repeat that question? We had the uh, speakers a little bit quiet. Does it cost any money, tuition money, to go to high school or college in Slovenia? Nope. No. All inclusive by the wonders of taxpayers. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cecilia here, when, when she goes to college, it can cost her like $100,000 or $150,000 to go to college. So most of the people her age go into debt. And it, it becomes crazy. She wants to become a lawyer, then that debt could go up to three or four hundred thousand dollars. So you know that'd be more than a lot of people are paying taxes in their lifetime, probably. That's a lot. All we can say is good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what about y'all like um, endorsements? What type of uh, things y'all do? Like, uh, um, what's the main focus or career choice or uh, such a thing? At your school. Yes, at your school. All right, so I don't think any of us here is like 100% sure what we want to become. Like, you have a goal to become a lawyer. Like, I just know I want to study English and um, in the next 20, 40 years of my life, I just want to uh, have English part of my life. That's all I know. So I have no idea what I want to become or what I want to do. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, not a good <laughs> Well, actually, in Slovenia, we are deciding in one year. I think a lot of students decide what are they going to study or which college are they going to be in in like one month before you apply. Apply, yes. So it's really quick and decision. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to high school of economics, but uh, I want to study journalism uh, or something connected with movies, uh, editing, and uh, photography. Um, I don't have like big goal. I would like to do something with computers, but that's about it. I'm going to stay in economics as a backup. Otherwise, I'm going to try to focus on politics. To be honest, I got no clue. I'm going to try to go uh, study history. Man, I'm going to try to travel a lot, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really upon the indiv individual here, you know. It's, yeah, it's I nice. think even though... Did you hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> even though this is a high school of economics, I think at least 70% of our students won't go any further in economics. In our class, there's, there is, what, 30 people, and about 10 of them will go to, will, go, will study economics. Other than that, we are really different. We are really individual, so yeah. yeah some of um, us actually don't go to study anything, we just go to work, so yeah, that's possible too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do y'all study economics? Or, uh, how, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, like, what do you do? Numbers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. A lot of numbers. And we, it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we mostly study accounting, lots and lots of accounting. 
I d uh, we definitely don't, do not get bored here. That is certain. No way. Uh, do you have um, any more questions or um, comments? No. No, I believe we're done. pretty much done here. Do you guys have any more questions or are uh, we done? No, I don't have any more questions. Well, in that case, in the name of my colleagues here and in the name of our economics school and our teacher here, I'd like to say thanks and farewell, <laughs> I guess. You know, bye bye. That's all, folks. Bye, good luck. Now we're going to wave bye. like idiots. Yeah, I'm, how do you shut this thing off? Uh, like this?